a question during the break. That way we do have to do the smooth thing. And uh, uh, I'm sure I gave the right answer, but it seems she got it. <laughs> but I will just uh, give you my explanation of that. Okay. As, you as I mentioned to you before that, my background was electrical engineer. I was a control engineer. And uh, we measure the electricity in the motors, uh, the, the rotations of those. And uh, these type of signals are something that we see a lot, which means that you see there is some of the real trend of signal. That is what real signal look like, together with uh, a s many noise that sitting on top of it. Okay. Sometimes it depends on the distribution of those noise. Uh, this is a side issue. So we are just waiting for people to come back. Right. So when you see these signals, look, uh, when we look at the, the different noise distributions, and there's something called the white noise. That's something we, we, we see a lot, which means they really don't follow s certain patterns, but their intensities are kind of just random. And uh, just uh, so, so it, what, what, what can cause that is, uh, is uh, once you do the measurement, you, your, your equipment may receive some kind of uh, random noise from somewhere and then that's on top of it if your signal is small enough and noise is bigger enough and they cause this type of thing. For this uh, uh, scenario, and those noise can be caused by, for example, uh, our sampling issue. So the sequence is not deep enough so for that region and uh, you, you got more rays or versus uh, not too many rays and those are just a random sampling issue. If you sample deeper enough, and you probably get uh, uh, the noise smoothing out a little bit. And also it's possible to cause by the mappability issue or other type of a chemical issue. For example, when you do the sonication where the breakdown should happen, or especially when you do the use enzyme di digestion where those breakdown could happen. So it's, there's a lot of random effect happens. And that's why that you see this type of uh, signals. And if you see there's a big peak around here, uh, here and then there's a follow with a sharp dip, that really doesn't mean anything. It's just a noise on top of the real signal. So once you do this window size smoothing, and you will, that will potentially help you to recover the original signal uh, in a much greater detail. Okay, that was my explanation. I'm not sure she bought it, but but it seems that she she got it. All right. But anyway, so let's uh, move on uh, to the next topic, which is the background issue. Okay, and uh, so once in the in the previous one we talked about the tag shifting, tag extension, and the goal of those is all trying to identify the signals from the chip seek data. But if you see there's a there's a peak around here, <coughs> if you see want to say is this a good one? Is this the enriched one, chip enriched one? If you look only look at this particular peak, you cannot make any conclusion. Okay if we do not comparing this with the background signals. And so what is the background signals? The statistical significance of tag clustering depends on the expected background pattern. One assumption that most people make is that background tag density is distributed uniformly along the genome and independently between the strands. So you can see this is one example. So you see the blue one is a, is a chip enriched signal and the black one is uh, the background signal, okay? And uh, for this one, you can clearly see this background is uh, not keeping up with the chip enriched signal. So you can have certain level of confidence to say this is a real chip derived peak, enriched peak, okay? But if your background at this location happens to be also the same type of pattern, and you probably won't define this as a peak. That's, that's what, uh, why I say that once you, you want to calculate the statistical significance, not only you want to see the, what the signal look like, but also the background look like. And the source of, uh, there's a many different source of non-binding enrichment. Non-binding enrichment. So this is not a non-binding enrichment. This is a binding event. But if in the input sample, which is non-binding, and you also see this type of enrichment. That also happens a lot in the real data. If you look at uh, the, the chip seq data and for some no IP, no immunoprecipitation control samples, sometimes you also see this type of uh, peaks somewhere in the genome. We see that a lot. 
there's many different ways that this can happen. The first one is uh, uh, there's a variations in the chromatin accessibility. So we know that some part of the chromosome, they are packed very dense. So it's really hard to break it and to, to do the further do the sequencing. But some other part is very loosely packed or there's no, chromo there's a, there's no histone around that region if it's an extended open area. So even though you don't do the, the protein enrichment, the chip enrichment, you will still, it's easier for you to grab that part of signal. So sometimes you see even in, in the no IP input control, you still see a lot of uh, uh, enrichment here and there. And this is one of the reasons for that. Another one is more like a sequencing related variation that this will include the, the mappability issue. Maybe some region you don't, nearby region you don't see any signal because it's not really mappable. And uh, or some of the sequence are harder to sequence than others. For example, if one sequencing rate is uh, all the CG, 90% are CG, and uh, it's pretty, pretty hard to sequence that, that fragment. So if uh, you've got more AT, you can, so those kind of uh, sequencing composition differences can also give you this uh, sequence-based uh, uh, variation, okay? So again, the point of this slide is uh, once you want to study the significance of a peak, you better look at uh, what the background is. There's a couple of uh, different types of background noise. So this is a, a paper, I think it's cited in the previous slides and by Peter Park's group uh, at Harvard. So you can see, if you don't see it very well. So there's actually two lines in this figure. One is uh, this uh, dark, this uh, really black line, that is the input sample. And another one is this, a, a very faint one, that is uh, the chip enriched sample. So the first type of variation, you will see this singular peak of tag density. And, uh, and their conclusion is that if you look at this type, it's uh, pretty easy to get rid of. So you see there's a kind of enrichment in the, in the, in the chip and also there's an enrichment here in the, in the input samples. And that suggests that this region has something weird and going on. So you can, you can really get rid of it. The second type, which look at, like more like this, is uh, uh, it's non-uniform, but it's really, really wide. As you can see, there are over 1,000 base pairs. You can see this, and, uh, and uh, the clusters of increased tag density on one or both two strands. So actually, there's also the, the chip the, and, the, and the input samples in there. So this is another type of background noise. You can, you can anticipate a lot. And the third type, which is really difficult to get rid of, is uh, once you look at the reads, it really look very much like a real. If you, you have a good eye, especially when you sit from the back, there's a faint line here. The faint one is the chip enriched ones. So you can see this is almost identical, it's perfect example as uh, what we see from previous slides. However, when you look at the input samples, it also has this pretty perfect shape as well. And that suggests that this region has uh, some problem. And uh, for this type of regions, you really, really need an uh, input control to get rid of. If you don't do input control for this, and uh, probably you, you, you don't get, the, get rid of the noise. So this type three is normal peak, but appear in both control and chip enriched assays. Very difficult to end up and need negative control to get rid of, okay? But point here is uh, people study, and actually this study is based on this 2007 science paper uh, the first chip seek experiment, and uh, and they derived this uh, several different type of background noise. And uh, to call a peak, we need to construct a background no a model. Again, when you look at this, so you see this is a real chip enriched signals. There's a peak here, and this is the background signals. And how do you estimate the background uh, uh, signal? So there's a three different uh, scenarios. The first one is uh, remember a lot of people to save money, we do not do input control. And there's a one scenario which no control. And the second one is that you do have a negative control. And the third one is uh, you want to compare two different conditions before and after drug treatment. So you do not have input control for this, but you do have two different conditions to compare against each other. For example, MCF7 versus MCF7 treated with estrogen. And that is a, a two comparison. And this is a, one, one sample MCF7 versus MCF7 the input control and uh, 
And the first scenario is if there's no control at all. So let's uh, uh, get, get through the first one, which is no control, what people do to call it a peak, which they will estimate the background tag distribution using a Poisson or negative binomial distribution. So if they observe a peak around that region, okay, they will, un under the assumption that all the background noise should be equally distributed, and one window size they look into that number of fragments, in, even in the background, should follow a Poisson distribution. And then they can, they can generate this background distribution and comparing with the real distribution from the data and to call the significance. The second one is a width control. So when you do the input control, now you can get down to more position specific. Okay, at this location, in the real sample, you see a peak. And in the input sample, you probably also detect some signals and you can estimate the background noise at this particular location based on the input samples and that is increasing your power dramatically. And the third one is width control. Width control is a substrate. So you, you got, um, um, you got uh, MCF7 versus MCF7 treated with E2, two conditions. Now the con strategy people may take is a substrate just to subtract the signal along the genome from ChIP-seq data. So using the E2 induced one minus the signals in the, in the uh, control samples. And that potentially can work. And uh, the signals can be thresholded by its enrichment ratio relative to the control. So you can see this. Uh, this is uh, the control sample. This is uh, an input sample. This is uh, uh, the real signal. And the, these differences, uh, they will call it enrichment relative to background, so enrichment ratio. And, uh, and this is uh, three different strategies, especially difficult when it's the first one. When you don't do any control, you have to estimate a background noise based on that. Yes? How to estimate a background? Be because you have uh, the signals along all the genome, and those are input controls. So you can basically look at the distribution. You, when you break it down into smaller window size, you can count the numbers in the window size, and those are input controls, right? And then you can estimate, if you, have, you follow the Poisson distribution, you can estimate the, the parameters in the Poisson or negative binomial. So that, that helps you to get. Well, no. That is, uh, you are talking about no control, how to estimate that. So, so what I was talking about to use, to use input uh, control and to estimate that. But for the, for the no control ones, is uh, you will just uh, make the assumption that most of the genome are not binding sites. So the binding sites is only a very small proportion of the genome. So once you break down the genome, the rest part into smaller pieces, even though there's some piece you do see one or two binding sites in there, and uh, there's the enrichment, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the overall distribution too much. You can still estimate your percent distribution uh, based on the data. Um, it's, it's just like uh, the, uh, along the entire genome, only a very tiny proportion are the real binding sites, just based on that assumption. Uh, you will have to assume that you have enough rates on that. So they know, for example, like, uh, what is the R of how many rates of R? Uh, um, on R, the binding sites, some of them rates are not. Well, it doesn't really matter because when you look at the distribution, you are looking at, uh, you use each window as a, as a unit. Okay, if there's a one window that has 10,000 rates, uh, let it be but it still just be one window. And then basically by the end of the day, your, your background the distribution estimation should be based on the, the, the histogram of the, the number of rates in each individual window. So if, if, there's a, if you have 100 million windows across the genome, okay, and only, let's say, 10,000 of them are real signal regions, those are only representing very small proportion of overall. So you still have enough information to get you through the, the rest of the background noise. 
But we, we can talk about that later. Let's move on. Okay. So the for the peak call, the, the main quality criterion is either an absolute signal threshold or a minimum enrichment relative relative to the background of both. So which means that if you, some different algorithm they call the, the there's a peak in different criteria. Some of them uh, I do want to this part has a lot of signals, or which is absolute signal threshold, or it has to have enrichment over certain kind of background. Sometimes algorithms require both. So different software use different specific specifics. And uh, there's a review here, which is very, very good. I, I, most of my figures actually is from this review. And, uh, and uh, they also concluded that the p-value from different methods are not really comparable to each other. So if you, you use one algorithm to calculate p-value, say this is the peak, p-value is this, and uh, another algorithm, they are not comparable to each other at this stage. And there's no way that we can do that. Um, so. Let's go through the post-detection filter. And uh, so after it detected this is the peak, there's some other information can help you to get through some of the noise. The first one is uh, the tag directionality. So meaning that fraction of a positive and negative tags, the presence of a positive and negative tags left and right of a peak. So uh, you, you want most of the positive tags are in the left side of the, the, the peak. and uh, negative ones in the right side of the peak. So th this is uh, one of the things that people do the filtering. And uh, they also want to eliminate tags of a single size that show counts much greater than expected by chance. So which means that uh, in some of the regions, uh, you might see some weird thing happen, like uh, um, 100,000 rays that are stacking on one genomic location from the bottom to the up. All right, uh, this is not a joke. We do see that. And uh, in our first uh, uh, chip seek experiment, we have seen um, I, I, one of the samples, I think over 50% of the rays are in one genomic location. All right, the reason for that, uh, later people figure out, is that those PCR steps really mess things up and that they really aggregate things in and uh, eventually generate those artifacts. But those are something that uh, why people do in this. So if you see something weird in one genomic location, don't focus on that. That mo most likely is the early junk. And this comes to the genetics question, right? Why sh we, we should get rid of rays uh, for both the positive and negative strand. The rays on the positive strand should be upstream of the binding sites, and those on the negative strand should be the downstream of binding sites. So you can see that the, for the single binding sites, and you want to see the positive peaks like this, the negative like this, and the binding size is sometime somewhere here. But sometimes you also see this type of scenario, which suggests that there's a multiple binding sites in there. And, uh, and those are the things, uh, I don't have a solution for that. But, uh, but once you get rid of things, you probably want to do some manual job to, to look at whether this sequence really tends to uh, cluster together. And another thing you, you might also want to try is uh, for, for the sequence, for the, for the region like this, once you identify this and you are ready to get rid of it, okay? And before doing that, look at the sequence of features in this region to see whether it's possible there's uh, some kind of dimerization or trimers that in this region, so because sometimes the proteins do work in that way, okay? All right. Um, so, so this is uh, the part of a peak detection, and we will talk about the motif finding in the, in the later slides, okay? And uh, now, there's a second thing that we want to go through, is the fragment length evaluation, only two slides here, okay? As I mentioned here is, uh, there is a, a distribution for the fragment size, so just to remind you where we are. You got the, the chip seek, the first step, you do the cross-linking, and then you break the DNA into smaller pieces. And then you grab, you use the antibody to target that protein. Now you have that DNA sequence, which is a, a couple of hundred base pair long. And then you only sequence the beginning of it. All right. So this is, uh, the, for this uh, couple of hundred base pair long, that DNA fragments, and th this has, it's a site specific. So we, 
we have we can control the size of it. And uh, this is one of the figures. I don't know how, whether you can see it from the back. So I got from the internet, from Sage Science. So you can see that this, uh, uh, they run this gel, and once they, they did this uh, uh, sonication, and they got the, 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 the fragments, they chipped it, and they want to sequence it. And then they really run it gel, and you can see this is one thing that is around 300 base pair, and there's another around 200 base pair. And then what their practice is, you will cut this part of gel and purify that DNA to do the further sequencing, right? So that is uh, one of the size selection uh, step. And this is size selection in the sample preparation stage, and uh, if it's a, it's a sonication, and uh, that depends on the intensity of uh, the pulse and duration that you gave for the, for the DNA samples. Um, but, the, but sometimes it's not only controlled by that. Be the reason for that is uh, further PCR steps will favor the shorter fragments. So if you have fragments, you initially think it's about 300 base pair, that's where you control it. But eventually, you, you probably, the, after PCR steps, you are favoring those shorter RNA, uh, DNA fragments. So those are really hard to evaluate it just based on the gel pictures uh, from this stage. And uh, therefore, the size of the, these DNA fragments are usually determined by computational approaches and we'll tell you what, how. And uh, as the earlier slides uh, mentioned, when you do the peak detections, why are we concerning this? Because when you do the peak detections, both tag shifting and the tag extension needs you to know how long your DNA fragments are, right? For the tag shifting, you want to shift half of the, the size of the DNA fragments. For the tag in extension, you want to sh shift the entire size. Um, and the, actually, the way to do this is very, very simple. So what you, you, you got here is uh, you just do the cross-correlation of positive and negative strand the tag densities, okay? You, you got the, all the tag densities uh, on the positive strand, on the negative strand. And then you do the correlation. So you can see X here is uh, the fragment length, right? If the, 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 the length, the average length is about 100 base pair, so once you shift 100 base pair, you are expecting to get a perfect correlation of a positive and negative signals, okay? So what they do is they will just, uh, X here is the read length, and the Y here is uh, the Pearson correlation of signals by tags from the forward and the reverse strand after shifting this uh, fragment S. Are we all get it? Or not? Yes? Pause? <coughs> so, okay, let, let's go through that again. So you, you got uh, all the signals along the positive strand. And along the negative strand, we know there will be a gap here, and we are not sure how big the gap is, right? We can look at it for one individual peak, but we cannot look for, it for the genome-wide. It's pretty difficult. So what you do is uh, you shift maybe 10 base pair of this and to see, is, are the two signals correlating with each other? No. Another 10 base pair? No. Another ten. After you get a 200 base pair, wow, the correlation of positive and negative signals are really, really good now. And that will suggest you that the, the peak of this uh, fragment is uh, 100 base pair or 200 base pair. Okay, just uh, shifting that a little bit and then calculate the correlation. And this is the way that we use a computational method to evaluate the length distribution. Okay? You do need to write some code on that or pay some money and, uh, and uh, to buy the software. So Partech actually has this uh, this uh, functionality, you just uh, put your sequencing rays in there, and this is the figure that is generated. So you can see clearly that there is how many, <coughs> this is a 100 base pair around this region, there is a, a clear peak there. That suggests that this fragment length is 100 base pair. Question? No? But this is a very important step we have to do, because uh, when we do the peak calling, either tag shifting or tag extension, both are using this information. Now, the saturation analysis, and this becomes, uh, uh, start to become, most people are not familiar with this, but this becomes really critical. The question here is uh, the depth of the sequencing rates. Uh, so how much is too much? When I do a chip seq data on, let's say, AP1, C1, 
defaults, okay, AP1 binding protein. How many reads do I really need? Do I need 1 million reads, 10 million reads, 100 million reads? I don't know, right? So will increase the sequencing depth give you more binding size? If it's still giving you more binding size, you probably want to get more sequence so that you get more binding size, right? So one way to look at this is uh, um, how many sequencing reads are detectable around the true binding size. So when you identify a true binding size, you want to see how many sequencing reads are there, okay? So you can see this is uh, with a, a big dynamic range, meaning that most of the, 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 the true binding size around that, the signal you detected are pretty low. But some of them can go through a couple of hundred base rates. So some of the binding size has uh, many 800 rates in that region. Others has maybe 10, 5 rates. So it's a huge, huge dynamic range. It's continuous, no clear subpopulation of binding positions here. So this suggests that increasing sequence depth allows a greater number of weak binding positions to be discovered. Okay? This part, for the sites that doesn't have too many binding tags detected, and most likely they are, we call it a weak binding size. So if you increase the sequencing depth, you have better chance to find out the the weaker uh, binding sites, okay? And the more pronounced binding sites are easier to identify. So if there's a something that is really obvious, uh, regardless of what approach you use, you can find it. And also, maybe you don't have to sequence very deep, you will be able to find it. And smaller sequencing, for, for those of very uh, obvious uh, protein binding sites, and smaller sequencing depth is adequate. But when we ask the question, so the initial question was framed a little bit um, not very accurate. So when we asking, how do I sequence enough? This is a saturation issue. We should always ask uh, another factor that kicking in here, which is uh, how greedy you are, right? So which means uh, how weak a binding size do I allow? I always want to see the bind the weak binding size, right? The more weaker the binding size I see, if it's real, that gives me good feeling that I'm detecting all of the information. But you have to stop somewhere. So you have to define your greediness by saying this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to look for this strength of binding size and lower than that, I'm not going to care about that. So there's a definition of this is called the minimal saturated enrichment ratio, and the, which is the minimum tag enrichment ratio relative to the background that is saturated in a given sequencing depth. Okay? So let me give you a real example. Hopefully this will make better sense. Otherwise, uh, again, this will not be in the quiz, but you it will be in the final exam, so you, <laughs> you still have opportunities to, to work through the, the slides uh, after you go back and, uh, and uh, to understand this better. <coughs> so you can see this is the uh, X here is the number of tags. This is a half a million rays, 1.5 million rays. Y here is uh, the fraction of uh, uh, calls that are, so you can see for, for, for a figure like this, that means uh, it's saturated. So you further increase the sequencing depth, it doesn't help you to identify more sequencing, uh, more um, binding sites. Okay, but this one represents, is larger than 30-fold of enrichment, okay, comparing to the background. So, so this is really strong binding sites because uh, the binding sites itself is, uh, it has to be 30-fold or more comparing to the background signals. If you are looking for that strong binding size, you don't need too many reads, you will be able to reach the saturation. And uh, this dashed line is 7.5 fold enrichment. So if you are doing 7.5 fold enrichment comparing to the background, if that's your cutoff, and then you probably need a little bit further to get to the enrichment. And this will, the, the, the saturation, for this definition will be 99% of peak agreement when you reduce the data set by 100,000 base pair, uh, uh, 100,000 rates, okay? So 
uh, you, you probably need to think this through a little bit. But point is, when you evaluate the saturation, you want to have a better idea how strong your signals, uh, uh, binding sites you are targeting. If you are targeting very weak binding sites, you want to sequence a lot deeper. If it's not too, too weak, a 30-fold difference, and you got only 300,000 rates, you probably already get to the saturation. Does that make sense? Right. Just a concept wise. And this is just a different way to look at this. This is uh, X is uh, the log of number of attacks, the sequencing depth, and Y is the log of your greediness factor. Right? And you can see clearly that if you are becoming more and more greedy, meaning that uh, you're targeting the weaker and weaker binding sites, you start to need more and more sequencing rates. Actually, uh, I want you to go back to let, take a look at this because I'm thinking, I haven't made the final exam yet, but I'm thinking some of the final exam may come from here. The reason I think this is important is when you write an NIH grant, okay, you always need to do the justification, how many resources do I need and, and how many things do, do I, but, and, and most of those are need, needs to be based on the preliminary data. So based on the preliminary data, you can already generate this type of uh, saturation point. Right? And then this will help you to further per, uh, propose additional experiment. How many reads do I really need based on the data we already have? So think through it. I, I know you haven't got it, and uh, it took me a while to get it, but, uh, but think through it. You will get it, I'm sure. And the additional notes about this information is uh, a particular MSRER <coughs> value does not imply all the true binding sites with this enrichment will be identified. It doesn't guarantee that. It only tells you increasing, further increasing the sequencing depths won't help. All right? So just to make sure this is a concept, uh, uh, don't get confused. All right? And uh, next to the couple of slides, I'm going to just flash, flash through several uh, standard uh, a comparison of different uh, peak binder algorithm. Uh, uh, this is uh, the paper that I found out, so that I just uh, uh, gave you a, a few, just a very brief uh, uh, introduction of their uh, results. So comparison of different algorithms, regardless of uh, what content, is pretty difficult. And because so far there's uh, more than a dozen of algorithms that have been published, and independent evaluation is desired. We cannot say we publish this algorithm and see we are doing so much better than X1 and Z. Those are really sometimes not really independent evaluation. They are not really fair. And uh, so this is independent evaluation is desired. And sometimes it's very hard to get, get, get benchmark data sets. So meaning that we don't really know what is the positive or what is the negative, and how can we evaluate which method is doing better or worse. And uh, this is the paper published in PLOS One the last year, and to compare different peak binders. And they did de design several criteria. The first one is uh, they choose the data sets on protein with well-defined uh, binding motifs, like uh, NRSF or GABP and FOXA1. So we already, before the, the people do the experiment, we already know their sequence uh, binding sites uh, very well. And this will help us to give us uh, at least some idea whether we can target the right region or not. And they're also e trying to evaluate the sensitivity, which is the ability, ability to find the experimentally validated sites. The good thing of uh, all these uh, several trans factors are there's uh, hundreds, uh, sometimes dozens of uh, validated regions already been, um, P, I mean, they use people use PCR type of study and already find out uh, hundreds of binding sites. And those are really experimentally validated. So they want to see how sensitive different methods are, meaning that uh, what's the per percentage of those binding sites I already find out. And they also want to look for the specificity, which is very, very difficult and uh, which minimizing the false positives. This is difficult because uh, there's a lack of true negative sites. And we really don't know where this protein doesn't like. And uh, it's, it's hard to find. And the information they use is the percentage of uh, the fragments they identified 
containing the binding motif. So the hope is uh, if it's uh, identified and it has the binding motif, that is more likely to be true. That's why that they focus on several of the proteins, the motif has already been well defined. The first result here is uh, the quantity of peak reporters. Okay? These are the algorithms they compared. Okay? And the last one is not, but the, all the others are the algorithms they compared. So for different algorithms, you can see that uh, for different bars, those are different proteins. And for different algorithms, the programs were run with default or recommended settings, and default strengthening levels are set differently. So you can see that some of the algorithms identified much more than some other algorithms. That really annoy people, right? How do we know that which one is correct, which is not? And, but they did do the core peaks. Core peaks meaning um, those regions that has been identified by all the 11 algorithms they evaluated. And this represents about 75 to 80 percent of the smallest peak uh, list. And uh, they also did a pairwise comparison of uh, any two different algorithms. They found that 92 percent of peaks in the smaller list were also in big list. And uh, about 45 to 50 percent uh, of peaks in larger lists were also in smaller lists. I don't know how to make, make the use of this data, but the point here is uh, just to be precaution, just like tell, just a one or two algorithm tells you this is a peak or not, doesn't really give you a whole a lot of the information. And these are, uh, so it's, at this stage, it's hard to evaluate their, their functionality. And uh, sensitivity is a good one. So they use the qPCR verified true positives and con high confidence motifs, and they want to see how many, per what's the percentage of uh, true positives, uh, the positives they, are, they can recover, okay? So you can see that most of these algorithms for this uh, NRSF, qPCR results, they are pretty similar, right? So after the, the peak ranking about 1,000 ones, they recovered almost 90% of uh, uh, the experimentally validated peaks. That's really, really good. And uh, this one is start to uh, separate a little bit. So you can see this is uh, uh, this, this is uh, 11 different algorithms. So this is the GABP. So some of the algorithms, once you go to the, uh, let me use this, 5,000, you got about 80% of the reads, uh, experimentally validated ones that identified. But sometimes at the same number of reads, you got uh, only 55% of identified. So this really gives you the sensitivity of different approaches. Let me give you the answer who is the best one. And the best one here is, uh, the, is the peak seek. I think it's, uh, it's by the uh, Mark Gerstens group at, at, at Yale. Okay. And the, these two are based on PCR-based assays. This is uh, the confidence on the, on the motifs, whether this has the motif in it or not but you can see these different trends. And uh, another thing they, they want to look into is the peak accuracy, which is a percentage of peak with this uh, motif within 500 base pair of identified, uh, um, identified regions. So you can see this uh, um, with the number of ranked peaks, and uh, of course uh, the, the smaller the number is, the higher the ranking is. And you can see that uh, the higher the ranking ones, uh, they the percentage that have the motif is uh, much higher. <coughs> Once you, you, your ranking become lower and lower, and this, uh, this percentage that have that motif become lower and lower as well, okay? But nevertheless, this will be one paper you want to look into a little bit at the time that you choose different algorithms, okay? All right, now let's go to uh, the next topic, which is the motif finding algorithm and the related theories. Uh, let me get in started about 10 minutes and then we can, we can have another break. Okay. The reason we are doing this is uh, once you do the chip seek experiment, you identify so many genomic regions, you know this protein is binding in there. And then what, what's the next step? Right? Next step, natural step is uh, you want to look into the sequencing features of these rays and to see the regions you identify to see whether there's a true binding size or not and how do we, you want to design further experiment on that. 
And I will give you an example in how do we use this information. But before we go into that, I want to introduce a couple of theories related to the motif finding. This is not a sequencing specific, but this should be very useful. So a practical biological question here is, uh, if we know the DNA binding sites of a transcription factor, can we predict its binding sites in a given string of a sequence? Let's say this is the gene, the promoter region, this is the promoter region, and we know this transcription factor likes to bind on CCACGT, all right? And we know the promoter sequences, and can we know that whether this protein binds in this promoter or not, okay? It's pretty simple. You just look for whether there are CCACGT in the promoter region, and then you should be able to get the answer, okay? If there is one, it has the opportunity to bind there. But sometimes you look for this one. This is ACGTCC, GG, all right? But the reverse complementary one of this, it will be CCACGT. And uh, there's an option that this protein will bind there as well. And uh, so the methods to do this will be paste and copy the promoter sequence into the word and just a search for CCACGT and the reverse complementary one, and then you will find the potential binding sites. All right, that is bioinformatics as well, right? Um, and, and this is truly based on the sequence feature of this protein. But things are never that straightforward. We know transcription factor binding sites, they are kind of a degenerate. What that means is uh, we are thinking that this position, one is A and so on and so forth, but sometimes, if this location is a C, so this protein LX to A, 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 G, A, A, C, A, but if this is a C or this is a G, this protein can also bind there, okay? Not as well, but uh, still can bind there if there's one nucleotide differences. And for this, most people describing this will use another terminology, if you, you read the literature, so it's called consensus, which is just to use the, the largest number of uh, uh, occurrence of that nucleotide there, and so this is still AGAACA. But sometimes you got this tight situation, which, which you may get into this. If two lighter ties, and you got A, so I'm sure that you read some papers and uh, and uh, on the binding sites, you will see A, and this is, is either CLG and AA, and this is either CLG and this is either ALT. So, then, and this consensus sequence, uh, this is uh, how the people present the binding sites in old days, right? And, uh, but the problem of this is the consensus sequences are not suitable for very complicated patterns. For the reasonably complicated patterns, it's okay. Once we got to the real deal, and the data will look like this. Yeah. So if we see the same question, this is position one to six, and this is A, C, G, T, and all of the numbers. The consensus is A, G, A, A, C, A. But another presentation of this, this uh, factor will be called the position weight matrix, okay? So the number here is very simple. It's just a percentage of uh, this, uh, um, the real binding sites of people experimentally determined that contain this particular letter. So you see 100% in the first position is A, you'll put a one here, right? And the 14% uh, and is C, which is one out of seven is C. You put 14% here and the rest is G. So you just uh, put the percentage there. And this is uh, called a position weight matrix. And this is a, a better representation of uh, the, a, a sequence binding sites, okay? And most people are using this, actually. And uh, now we, we have to put that into a more prob probability uh, framework. So the biological question here is, uh, now I know this position weight matrix of this transcription factor, how do we assign a score to any particular sequence that describe their level of similarity? So meaning that this is my binding sites of position weight matrix. By the way, this is not difficult to get, all right? So there's a da database that has thousands of transcription factors and there's position weight matrix are all in there. So it's, uh, it's not difficult to, to get. So the question here is, if I have a sequence which is ACAACA, -A -A -A, 
And how do I know whether this uh, sequence uh, will be how similar to that, that position where the matrix is? So the way you do that is uh, quite simple. So you've got A, C, A, A, C, A. You just uh, A, C, A, A, C, A. Point out those numbers out, okay? And then you calculate the probability that if this is the binding sites, if this is the binding sites, and what's the probability I'm going to see this particular sequence. The way you do that is just uh, to time everything together. And that is the probability. If this is the binding sites, I'm going to have 10% of the probability to observe this particular sequence, okay? And another thing that I want to calculate, what is the probability that this is not a binding site? What's the probability this is not a binding site? If this is not a binding site, this random sequence, then I have 25% of the possibility to observe ACGT in every single nucleotide. And then your probability time together will be this tiny, tiny number, okay? And then you want to calculate the odds ratio of this is a binding size and not a binding size, and you want to divide these two, and you found this is 400 times more possible to be a binding size than not to be a binding size. And then what people do is assign a score, which is a log two of this odds ratio, which is 8.72. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now, people think it's too simple, and, and uh, let's make it more complicated. And there's another definition, it's called a position-specific scoring matrix, okay? So what happens is, uh, let's go through this again. And these are the numbers of, uh, based on the ex existing experiment, and the numbers of different locations, and so for this one, you can see this is a T, it's very specific in this location, but it can be something else as well. And so this is uh, the position, the counts. And then once you get to the percentage of position weight matrix, and then this part is 80%, 4%, 9%, and so on and so forth, okay? So this is the position weight matrix. And if we do the calculation, we can use the previous uh, uh, slide uh, method to do that. But uh, uh, people will convert this position weight matrix into another thing called the position specific scoring matrix. So what that is, is uh, you use this number divided by QA, which is a random, like if this is not a binding size, what's the probability you see an A? Usually everything is, a uh, background is 25%. So you use 0.04 divided by 0.25, 25%. And then you do the log two, you put the number here. So you can see that uh, Everything negative here, that suggests uh, it's a lower chance comparing even to the random. But every single location, you will see a positive number there, and that suggests that this is represent the specificity of this particular binding size. Does that make sense? But actually, I was talking about 25%, and actually that's not what people are using. People are using A and C. P, they use 30%, C and G, they use 20%. Because in the human genome, we have the AT is accounts for about 60% and CG accounts for 40%. But anyway, this is the percentage of this latter to be occurred in the ran by random. So you can see this is matrix is called a position weight mat uh, scoring matrix, position specific scoring matrix. But the question is, uh, why we need this? Why we want to make it so complicated? Well, actually, once you derive this, the calculation becomes really, really simple. Okay, for this particular one, let's say calculate the matching score for TAAAT. So what you get here is uh, you just uh, circle out these numbers, add them up together, and that will be your score. Okay, so you just uh, basically you transfer those previous uh, odds ratio and the probability ratio back into here and just to make it just very simple calculation. And that's uh, uh, how you do this. And of course you can calculate for any other binding size, you can calculate this score as well. That makes sense? All right. So when you read papers, 
and you got another type of representation, which is the sequencing logo. So we start from this one, which is the position weight matrix that is either the console percentage and position weight matrix, a specific square matrix, the log ratios. So this is ease for the ease of use. And by, when you read the papers, when you see, you have an idea what the binding site should look like. And when you present in this way, that's really annoying. But this is a much better way. So it tells you for this location position, and it, it's better to be a G. And for this position, it can be a G or A or U, right? So this is called a sequencing logo. So basically, if you put your sequence into the uh, software, they will generate this for you. It's not very difficult to do. And uh, how to interpret this logo is uh, there's uh, two factors I want to consider. The first one is the total height for each location. And the total height represents the information content at a specific location. So meaning that for this uh, binding size, this particular low size is very, very important. Okay? Don't mess up with that location. If this is a G, make it a G. If it's anything else, uh, and the prob probably the, the protein is not going to bind there because this particular letter is so important. So for each individual um, total height, that suggests the, the information content of that particular location. And the height of individual letter is uh, the contribution of, a contribution of a that particular letter. Okay? So you can see the total height of this is this much, but total height of this is this much. That means for this particular location, you can mess up with it. If, if it's a G, you put an A, that's okay. You put a U, that's okay. Just don't put C there, right? So that will kill your specificity. But anyway, so, so this is how you read this sequencing logo. Now comes to, to this. How are we going to use the ChIP-seq data? How, how can we use this in the ChIP-seq data to study the binding sites? All right, let's uh, take a five minutes break and we'll come back. I see people are start to sleep, get sleepy. <laughs> 